Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain and we are on day 2384 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Each Tuesday I'll share a message I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church this year. This lesson is the seventh of a 22-week message series exploring 1st and 2nd Peter. Today's message is titled, A Righteous Life and a Ready Defense. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. Appreciate everybody being here today. Appreciate each one in the church. The encouragement that you are to Paul and I as we minister here, we thank you for your blessings. Now last week we shifted from submitting to government authorities and to employers to how we should submit in our marriages and mutual submit, submission in a message titled The Give and Take of Domestic Harmony. And this week we're going to move forward. Now the overall theme of the book of First Peter is submission. In the theme today we're going to learn how to live a righteous life and have a ready defense. Our passage today is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 17. It is on page 1890 of your pew Bibles, but I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation today because the flow is more personal and applicable to our lives, our daily lives. It's very similar in its reading, but follow as I start with verse 8. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Now, who will want to harm you if you are e eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if somebody asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and a respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that's what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. And I think without a doubt, the process of spiritual growth is a long and sometimes painful route to maturity. Even as adults, sometimes we still spill our milk. We say things that we shouldn't. We fail to act in a way that represents us as adults. Sometimes we still throw temper tantrums like toddlers, or we pout like preschoolers, or we argue and complain like teenagers. We should conduct ourselves as mature believers and set an example for those who are younger in the faith. We may know what is right, but we don't have the will to always do what is right. Even those who are spiritually mature, we will have our days where we take return trips to the terrible twos. See, human parents rejoice when their children grow from infancy through adolescence and into adulthood. We just pray that they will mature also as they become adults. In the same way, our Heavenly Father wants all His children to grow in their faith. But sadly, too many Christians grow up or grow old without growing up. The difference is obvious. Many people can say, well, I've been a child of God for over 30 years now. But sometimes you want to say back, well, there comes a time when we need to mature into adulthood. Just because you're physically an adult, we also need to act as adults in our spiritual lives. 
First Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, the apostle Peter sums up what he sees as a lifestyle that epitomizes Christian maturity. As such, these virtues give believers a measuring rod for spiritual growth, just like this yardstick, which is actually four feet long instead of three feet long, is a measuring rod where I could take this and measure wood or fabric or anything that we want to measure. Well, Peter gives us in today's lesson a measuring tool that we can use in order to measure whether we are maturing as Christians. Is our spiritual growth continuing? As a tangible, objective set of checkpoints, we can use these, what Peter lists here, to measure our maturity in different areas of our lives. In these five verses, Peter summarizes his comments in the form of nine marks of maturity. Remember, Peter's purpose in this section of the letter is to accurately describe that strange life that we're to live as believers in relationship to the world. The list of Christian virtues certainly flies in the face of our culture and the cultural norms today. They set us as believers apart from people in the world, especially in an unholy lifestyle. But again and again, Peter ties these lifestyles to holiness in a life of hope that we have in Christ. To be consistent with what we anticipate is the reward of Christ returning a second time to establish God's kingdom here on earth, finally. Maturing, whole, mature holy living will come as we embrace Christ as our hope in hurtful times. So let's look at verses 8 through 12. Peter begins the maturity checklist with the phrase, finally. And the Greek word is telos, and it means to end or the conclusion. But Peter's not concluding his letter here. He's concluding what he taught us previously about submission to those that are in authority or within a marital context. But now he's going on to believers and our mutual submission to one another. The purpose of his previous teaching was concerning our attitudes and our actions. The preceding context instructed believers to live as temporary residents here on earth in their conflict against fleshly desires. And he did this in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And then his conflict played out in the battlefields of unjust treatment by human government in chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And unfair behavior of our employers or masters in chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. And then last week we saw the struggle that we might have in our married life in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. When Peter sums up the virtues of an ideal temporary resident, as we all are living in this world, he touches on several things that he's already covered. But then he anticipates several other themes through the rest of this letter that he has. These are maturity checkpoints, which include unity, mutual interest, friendship, affection, compassion, humility, forgiveness, a controlled tongue, a pure life, and a peaceful disposition. If you look at your bulletin insert today on the side, it says a righteous life and a ready defense. Let's go through each of those nine maturity checkpoints today. First maturity checkpoint is we're to be one mind. Harmonious. The Greek word is homophron. And the Greek word refers to having the same mind. It implies a oneness of heart, a similar similarity of purpose, an agreement on significant points of doctrine. As I mentioned before, unity is not uniformity where everybody looks and acts the same, nor is it unanimity, where everybody agrees 100% on everything that we have. Peter isn't calling us to sing in unison. He's calling us to sing in harmony, which means that we each contribute our own unique notes to a beautiful chorus for surpassing what surpasses any single note could be. The second maturity checkpoint is sympathize or sympathetic. The Greek word is sympathias. The Greek word sympathias lies behind the English word of sympathy. And it literally means to feel with someone, to understand what they're going through. When we are in close fellowship with believers, as Peter has in mind, we'll naturally affect each other emotionally. Rejoicing when others rejoice, weeping when others weep. 
We have a mutual interest in each other's in our lives on a personal level. The third maturity checkpoint is to love each other. And this is a brotherly love, the Greek word philodephos. The Greek word philodephos is an adjective form of the same word that Peter used for brotherly love in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20, verse 22. And he refers to this affectionate friendship or a love for a sibling, assuming you got along with your siblings. That's the love he's, he's referring to here. The affection companionship is much deeper than often superficial activities that we claim to be fellowship among Christians. Philadelphia indicates a sense of loyalty just as strong as one natural family relationships of a natural family. The fourth checkpoint is tender-hearted, kind-hearted. The Greek word here is a little bit bigger. It's you plonchnos. And Paul refers to the same word in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. He says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. This heartfelt compassion closely associated with forgiveness and emphasizes the actions to be taken out of her, to, toward hurting people. The fifth checkpoint is a humble attitude, or be humble in spirit. And the Greek word here is tapiophron, and it means to have a humble mindset. It might be easy to appear humble and act with false modesty, but Peter has that deep down humility in mind that nobody can see, and that is the humility of our thought life. In our me first world, especially I think in the United States, we're in fiercely independent. We have find it hard to swallow the principle Christ taught, the last shall be first. When, Peter are blessed, or when people are blessed with exceptional talent or skills, we're tempted to pro promote ourselves. And we crave, I think even uh, the most shy person craves, in some manner, the limelight. A true spirit of humility curbs our ego's insatiable desire and appetite from within. Now, these first five virtues of mature Christians all relate to how we think, being of one mind and a humble attitude, how we feel to being sympathetic, having brotherly love, and being tenderhearted. And then the last four characters relate to what we say and what we do. The outward actions, as they directly affect people, and none of these, of course, are mutually exclusive. You can't have some without the other because each one impacts the other. A person won't feel compassionate, affectionate, and sympathize if they are proud and contentious. As a believer, won't manifest virtuous words and deeds if their thoughts and emotions are those of a novice Christian or a baby Christian. Mind and emotion will grow together into a well-rounded, balanced character. And this will lead us to a lifestyle that befits us as Christians, that others will see us and be attracted to our life. So the sixth maturity checkpoint is to have a forgiving nature. In verse 9, it says, don't repay evil for evil. Because refusing to exact revenge when we have been injured, somehow this is one thing. But replying with a blessing, either in word or in deed, is quite another. It's one thing to be insulted and not retaliate. It's quite another thing to be insulted, insulted and then bless the one that insulted you. That's hard to take. We're so tempted to strike back. Because we've been called to inherit the blessing, and because Christ has secured our hope, we can endure evil and insults with patience and grace. We can return blessing for insult. The seventh maturity checkpoint is a controlled tongue. Verse 10 says, don't retaliate with insults. Peter quotes Psalm chapter 34, verses 12 and 13 here. Grounding his call in a controlled tongue is firmly based in the Old Testament. The quote immediate follows Peter's warning against lashing out in vengeance in verse 9. So the thought is that our words are more likely to get away from us when we are tempted to strike back. And we need to be careful about that. The mature believer's tongue must be tamed. It avoids gossip, slander, crude language, deception, exaggeration, and all kinds of e wicked and folly. It reminds me of another psalm, Psalm 141, verse 3, where the psalmist cries out to the Lord. He says, take control of what I say, O Lord, and guard my lips. 
I think those are good words that we should say when we rise every morning before we have an opportunity for stray words to slip off our tongues. The eighth maturity checkpoint is a life of purity. In verse 11, turn away from evil and do good. So he continues to quote Psalm chapter 34, verse 14, and Peter recasts his repeated exhortation to holy living. Purity from wickedness means turning away from evil inclinations, temptations, and even the sins that beset us in our past. Instead, we must replace the wrong thoughts and habits with pure and positive ideas. And the ninth maturity checkpoint is a peaceful disposition. Verse 11, search for peace and work to maintain it. So there's two action verbs here, search and work to maintain peace. We're a people who love to argue and fight. It says something within our nature when somebody goes against us, especially. When we're wrong, we jump to our feet to defend ourselves. We dig on our he heels when we're challenged, and we clench our fists when somebody crosses us, and we want to strike back. Whether it's over a minor doctrinal issue or something as mundane as the color of a carpet in the church, Christians can quickly rob each other of their peace instead of seeking peace and pursuing it. We often pursue controversy and engage in open conflict. Instead, we should be servants of the Prince of Peace, as Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 describes Christ, reflecting that peace in the church and in the world. So behind Peter's list of Christian virtues stands a critical assumption. He's assuming that believers can grow in their maturity, in their spiritual maturity, and points the way that we must walk consistently in light of God's word. I didn't say that we'll walk perfectly. That would be impossible. We will stumble, but we need to walk consistently on a regular basis. A consistent life of unity, mutual interest, friendship, affection, compassion, humility, forgiveness, self-control, purity, and peace doesn't mean that we'll never fail in each of those areas. What it means is when we do fail, and we will, we get back up, acknowledge it, and allow God to God's grace to restore us and strengthen us so that we're less likely to do it again. So these nine virtues of spiritual maturity are general enough to encompass all of our area of life and yet specific enough that we can apply each of these points to how are we doing in each of these points. When properly understood, Peter's rapid-fire arrows point the weakest spots in our spiritual armor, convicting us that we are still disciples in training, we've not arrived yet, but we're on our way. But as we examine these chinks in our armor, it's easily to lose sight of big Peter's bigger perspective. He has in mind a greater purpose for us acting as we should, for holiness and hope, because we're living in an unholy and hopeless world. And that's why it's so crucial that we live the lives that we do. Which takes us to the second section of our passage today, verses 13 through 17. Peter makes it clear that spiritually mature men and women described in those verses 8 through 12 will provoke a response of the world around us. It won't help. It can't help but provoke a response. Many in the world live in lifestyles that are conflict instead of peace. They live in sin instead of purity. They live in pride instead of humility. They live in hatred instead of compassion. And some will view, view believers as speed bumps on their superhighway of self-gratification. Others may wonder, what would motivate somebody to live such a strange life of holiness and hope in today's world? So Peter asks his readers to consider an important question, and this question comes in verse 13. Who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? He has already defined what it looks like to be zealous or good in those nine checkpoints in verses 8 through 12. For the most part, living this way, though strange in the world's eyes, they might not understand why you live that way, will generally keep us as believers out of trouble. And it goes back to the laws of planting and harvesting. When you think about it, if you pay your debts on time, it'll make you financially sound. If you stay sexually pure, then it will avoid 
having disappointments and heartache and jealousy in your marriage. You'll keep from making enemies if you behave with humility and peace. People are less apt to attack you if you respond by these nine Christian virtues. When you maintain a close relationship with other believers also, you'll always have people to help you through those tough times when you're struggling. So in general, Peter's advice is wise living will bring you good, not harm, both to you and to others. But even when it doesn't work out that way, because we know there's always exceptions, living this way does have a lasting advantage. Why? Because in verse 12, Peter tells us, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. Though this principle may be generally accurate most of the time, in most situations, Peter knows that there will be exceptions at times, that we will be insulted and persecuted, even if we're living as we should. Because smoldering cinders of opposition can burst into outright persecution in certain times in history, in certain places in the world, and by God's grace, we were born in a country with so much freedom that we see see very little persecution today. But a lifestyle that the believer is might keep a believer safe in our country, might endanger him in another. Peter says in verse 14, but if you suffer for doing what is right, so there will be times that that might happen. In Peter's discussion of the possibility of unfair treatment, and I find five pieces of advice, and these are in your bulletin insert. You'll see four of them listed there because I missed one when I was creating this bulletin insert. So we'll go through five principles of advice to respond to as a Christian who have centered our hope in Jesus Christ. So if you have a pencil available, when I get down to point four, we're going to insert a new point four into our responses for unfair treatment today. The first response for unfair treatment is to consider yourself blessed by God in 14a. This isn't the response that we might expect. When we experience treatment, we might, foul treatment or unfair treatment, we might say, what have I done wrong? Hasn't God seen my good works? I've been saving up all these God points. Why is he allowing this to happen to me? Instead, Peter takes the approach similar to James, chapter 1, verse 2, where James wrote, Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any time come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. How can believers count themselves blessed by God in light of unfair treatments? And there's two ways we can do this. First, They are blessed because God uses this kind of unfair treatment at times to his plan to strengthen us and make us more like Christ, as we've already seen throughout the book of 1 Peter. Rather than marking us outside of God's will, sometimes when we receive unfair treatment, it is a righteous indication that we are actually in God's will and living according to his plan. And second, we are blessed because we can look forward to that future reward for enduring such trials. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's our great hope for the future, is that kingdom of heaven fully established here on earth. Very likely, Peter had these words in his mind as he wrote his own letter. Now, the second response to poor treatment for righteous living is to refrain from panic and worry in 14b. There's no reason to fear the enemy's method of intimidation or to be troubled in our lives as believers. That's hard to practice, but it's practical according to God's word. For the Greek verb for fear is phobio, which we get our words phobia from. It means fleeing or avoiding something. And also tied into this passage is the word trouble or tarasso in Greek. It refers to shaking up or intimidating somebody. And Jesus has used this exact word in John chapter 14, verse 1, when he tells his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. Peter's third response to mistreatment is to acknowledge Christ as Lord in 15a. He says, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life, contrasting it with fearing and intimidation of persecutors. Now, Peter is making it clear and direct claims that Jesus' deity 
equating him with the Lord God of the Old Testament and declaring that we should sanctify and regard him as holy because Jesus Christ is Lord over our lives. When Christ is Lord and God over all aspects of our lives, we need not fear the opposition of any enemies. No matter whether it's physical or just emotionally or mentally, we do not need to fear it. Now going to the fourth measured response, and this is one you'll need to insert, the fourth response to unjust treatment is to be, to, is to be ready to give a defense in verse 15b. Now the term defense is the Greek word apologia, and it means to give an account for, and the New Living Translation says to explain it, or to provide a legal testimony as if you were in a court of law arguing a case. Our English word is apologetics comes from this term. And Peter uses this for his readers when he says, and if somebody asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Note that this explanation for the hope comes only when we've considered ourselves blessed by God, refuse to panic or worry, and acknowledge Christ as our Lord and Savior, even if we have unfair treatment against us. And what happens when we do this? Well, people will see our lives our behavior, even when they insult us and marvel. How can you put up with this kind of treatment? I would have snapped by now because they don't have that hope in hurting times. Peter's overarching theme of Christ is our source of hope in hurtful times. And it comes to the forefront again here. And Jesus provides us a solid basis for hope and suffering. And finally, our fifth response to the world's unfair treatment is to keep a good or clear conscience in verse 16. Not only are we set apart Christ as Lord over every event in our lives, we must maintain a clear conscience on a daily basis, not to be anything to be convicted of because we're living according to God's precepts. Peter begins this section by cataloging those Christian virtues, those nine virtues, in verses 3 through 8. Then he points out that this holy living in this way generally will bring us good into our lives and not harm, but it can draw the ire of wicked people at times. But when this happens, Peter writes, we should endure those unjust treatment of others, unwavering in our integrity, not lashing back. Because the maintenance of a good and clear conscience, even amid persecution, will draw the attention of those around us that we intermingle with on a daily basis and it will silence those slanderers of our lives. In other words, Peters argues that a life that is consistent with integrity is a quiet defense of our Christian life. It opens up the opportunity, then, regarding the lordship of Christ in our lives, that we will have an opportunity when somebody asks us, he doesn't say, go and beat them up against their head to cram the gospel down their throats, but he says, when somebody asks you, you have the opportunity, because of the way that you live, to share the gospel with them, to share the Lord with them. So Peter brings this section to a close by echoing the principles that he stated in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. And although believers may suffer for unjust treatments by living a virtuous Christian life at times, we must be careful that we do not incur punishment because we deserve it. In verse 17, it says, remember... It is better to suffer for doing good, if that's what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Only when we suffer unjustly on behalf of Christ and as a testimony to others can we claim that we're genuinely walking in the pattern of our Lord, who suffered and died for our sake, as verse 18 tells us. So what's our application in today's passage? It's on the other side of your bulletin insert. I have a little coursework for you for this week. It's Apologetics 101 of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 17. And I've taken several seminary-level courses that I've completed over the past few years. I've learned about a good bit about apologetics of the Christian faith. And these great minds that have provided a well-reasoned and defense for the Christian faith in response to physiological, philosophical objections. And throughout the past 2,000 years of church history, every generation has had its Christian scholars who stood strong for the faith, sometimes against overwhelming opposition. And even today in our field of Christian apologetics, 
It's filled with PhDs and scholars who can argue atheists and unbelievers into silence. And I thank God that there are men and women who are trained both in the philosophies of the world, but more importantly, in the true wisdom of the word. But sometimes the rest of us might think, well, we get off the hook. I'm not an apologist. I can't explain the arguments for the existence of God. Or I can't fire off three responses to argue about the theory of evolution. Or I can't explain where Cain got his wife. So we leave these questions to qualified scholars, and we tell ourselves, well, we're not meant to be involved in apologetics. But Peter says here, on contraire, you are responsible to understand enough of about apologetics that you can defend your faith. Because the truth is, according to Peter in verse 15b and 16a, he says, if somebody asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do this with a gentle and respectful way. We should always be prepared to make a defense for the gospel that we have in Christ, and that's what apologetics is, to make a defense of the gospel. Yet presupposing an explanation, Peter describes a particular consistent lifestyle that will do more to draw unbelievers' attention than somebody who has a PhD in apologetics that's arguing about God's word your lifestyle will have a bigger impact on those that you associate with. It's Apologetics 101. It begins not with having the correct answers to every skeptical challenge, but having the proper lifestyle to raise the right questions among those you associate with. In 16b, it says, keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what good life you live because you belong to Christ. So to be faithful to Peter's exhortation, we need to examine our own lives and see how we measure up. And this is what our coursework is for this week. On the left-hand side, there are the nine maturity checkpoints. On the right-hand side, these are the stages of our maturity in our lives. Use this chart below to grade your level of maturity as infant, toddler, youth, teen, or adult in each of those nine areas. And I've envisioned this week taking a pencil and drawing a line like we used to do in our text test at school. Draw a line from the left-hand column to where you stand in the right-hand column and see where you measure up in your levels of Christian maturity. So to be faithful to Peter's exhortation, we need to examine this. And once you've discovered the areas of your life that are your most susceptible to immaturity, you can see where your own lifestyle apologetics needs to be strengthened. And you can use this chart to grade your maturity level. Now, you might need to go back to God's word and examine it a little bit closer, but that's a good thing. And select one area of growth to start with out of those nine and say, I'm going to focus on this area of growth in my life this week. Commit it to prayer. Focus on submitting this area to Christ's lordship, as described in verse 15 to aim for a good or clear conscience toward God in verse 16. And because we're called to grow together as a body of Christ, let's help each other to grow in these nine areas of spiritual maturity that we've gone over today. We might be able to share with each other a close friend or a family member or a teacher and somebody accountable to hold you accountable and pray for that growth in that area. Because Peter's summed it up in verse, chapter 2, verse 2 in First Peter, because he says, like newborn babies, you must crave spir pure spiritual milk so that you'll grow to the full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. So in your Bible reading, your Bible study, your devotional life, let's focus on these areas where we need to grow and mature as believers. And this is what Peter wants us to focus on this week. Now, next week, we're continuing the second section of this letter of 1 Peter called Our Strange Life in a message titled, Focusing Fully on Christ. So it takes what we learned this week and we'll homogenize it next week to focus fully on Christ. So invest time reading 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22 for next week's message. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you you've given us such clear guidelines in 1 Peter here, chapter 3, of what we need to do to be spiritually mature and how it will 
our actions and our lives will portray Christian maturity through these nine checkpoints, Father. We thank you that we can come to your word and understand how we need to live, and knowing that you've given us the strength to do so. Help us apply it to our lives this week. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.